we're going to open up in prayer this morning. Uh, don't forget, if you look around, there are several people missing this morning. Some people are traveling. Some people are home, sick. Dan Matthews, you all know, is probably watching uh, Dan and OY. And so continue to hold them in your prayers. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to ask, not that the Holy Spirit come to fill this place, but that we perceive the Holy Spirit among us. So let's pray. God, we are grateful to be gathered in this place, familiar faces, some new faces. We know that you have gathered us here for a time such as this, that it is not an accident that we are here this morning. We also know that your Holy Spirit is present in and through us. It's our very life source, and yet too often we go about our day forgetting who we are and whose we are. And so I pray that we would remember that this morning. That as we sing these songs, as we read the scriptures, as I preach a little sermon, that somehow in and through it we would catch glimpses of your holiness, of your divinity right among us and in us that something would open for us in a new way today. That as we head back out, to the, out the doors, into the parking lot, into our uh, weekly lives, that we might say something has shifted, something is different. Of course, we want to glorify you in all that we say and, and do. And that's a, that is a, a key component for us this morning, but we know that you don't need that. Uh, that you're not even necessarily asking for it. What your deepest desire is that we are transformed from the inside out, that we have a, a heart change, a mind change, a complete transformation. And so that's what we want this morning. As we praise you, as we glorify you, change us. We ask this in your holy name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Let's pray. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our hearts and our minds that as these ancient words are read, as a word is proclaimed, we might receive with joy that which you have for us today. Amen and amen. Listen to Paul's words to the church in Corinth. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. A word from God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, may your word be proclaimed through me or perhaps in spite of me today. 
Amen and amen. So this is my opinion. You can argue with me if you want on this. But I would say next to Jesus, Paul probably holds the title for being the most influential in the movement of Christianity. He's written the most of of what we would consider the New Testament. Most of them are his letters. Uh, Now, it's interesting that Paul never knew Jesus during his earthly ministry, uh, but did have an encounter with the risen Christ as he walked on the road to Damascus. And this encounter with Jesus fundamentally changed Paul through and through and through. In fact, before that, you, you would notice in the book of Acts, he goes by the name of Saul uh, and later goes by the name of Paul. Now, it's the same name. One is Greek and one is Hebrew. But this change of name uh, denotes a change of character, a change of person. He was a completely different person after he met Jesus in this moment. You know Paul's story. You've heard it. He was a, a, a religious zealous, piety, pie-eating, piety, um, Pharisee. Like, he was proud of his, uh, his education. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, uh, religious to the core, and really saw Christianity as a threat to, to pure religion, really was a threat to what God wanted to do with his people. And so he set out to Uh, to persecute and to bring in and even in some cases kill Christians to try to stamp out what he saw as a problem. But he had this 180 degree turn in the way that he saw things, in the way that he saw our job and what it means to be a, a, a follower of God, to be part of God's people. In fact, he saw the way of Christ, what Christians were first called, before they were called Christians, they were called members of the way. He began to see the way of Christ as God's desire for all humanity. And so from this moment on, he began to plant churches all throughout the land in places that people never thought a church could or should be planted He began to include Gentiles, non-Jewish people, into the fold. He included men and women into the ministry. And then as he set about uh, starting these fledgling churches, wouldn't leave them with a whole lot of instruction, would just get them started and then move on to the next place and start uh, just see who, who latched on to the message of Jesus. But then he would write letters back to these churches because they had questions. Paul, what do we do? Uh, our group is growing, or we've had some of these questions come up, or some of these issues, and Paul would write letters back to them, instructing them in the faith, how to grow in Christ, how to grow in their faith, how to continue to spread the gospel to new people. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to look at Paul's correspondence, uh, particularly with the church in Corinth. Now, we're going to be reading out of 2 Corinthians, but we know this is probably Uh, at least his third letter, because in 1 Corinthians, he mentions another letter that he wrote to them. We don't have that letter. So what we call 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is probably 2 and 3 Corinthians, or maybe even 3 or 4 Corinthians. We don't know. This wasn't the only letter, two letters that he wrote to them. But we're going to be looking at these letters, uh, looking at how Paul was showing them how they ought to live in light of the faith that they latched onto, the faith that they claimed for their own, how to follow Jesus, as they all waited for that moment in which Paul said in 1 Corinthians, God would become all in all. Paul had this vision that at some point, God will become all in all. And so he said, as we're waiting for that, this is how we ought to live. Now, we know Jesus, we've, we've read Jesus in the four Gospels, and, and you know And I know that Jesus was known for saying some pretty jarring things. Jesus would say some outlandish things like, if somebody strikes you on the cheek, I want you to turn the other cheek and let them hit the other side. Or he would say things like, if somebody steals your uh, cloak, I want you to give them your shirt as well. Uh, Or he would say, I want you to go above and beyond and I want you to love your enemies and to pray for them and to bless them. In fact, in one point in the Gospel of John, he said, you must eat my flesh and blood if you want to be a part of me, to which a whole chunk of people said, that's it, 
That's it. I can't take any more. That's just too much, Jesus. And they walked away, right? Jesus was known for saying some things that you, you really got to think about. You got to chew on. What is he trying to say here? What does this mean for me if I actually follow Jesus as he's calling me to follow? Well, Paul had a knack for saying some crazy things too. I don't have to tell you, as a follower of Jesus, Paul said some crazy things. For instance, in this section that we just read to the Corinthians, he said, you know, in serving you Corinthians, me and my co-laborers, Timothy and some of the others that would go out and help plant these churches, he said, we have endured all kinds of stuff in loving you and serving you. We have endured afflictions and hardships and calamities and beatings and imprisonments and riots and labors and sleepless nights and hunger, and yet we have always done it with purity and knowledge and patience and kindness and holiness and love and truthfulness. He said, we kept on keeping on, whether we were honored or dishonored among the people, whether we were slandered or praised, we kept doing the thing that Jesus asked us to do. When we were called imposters, we remained virtuous, we remained true. Uh, Whenever we were treated as nobodies, we didn't take offense, because that we know in Christ we are not nobodies. When we were beaten, we refused to die. When we were sorrowful, we continued to rejoice. Even though we were poor as dirt, we continued to pour out the riches of God's grace upon you. In having no possessions of our own, we know that all things are ours through Christ. Who the heck talks like this? Who lives like this? Anybody you know? Do you know anybody who would be beaten and imprisoned wrongly and then just would continue on in love and grace and truthfulness and holiness and purity? Is Paul delusional? Is he lying through his teeth? Is he kind of maybe padding the truth just a little bit to make himself look better? Or does Paul know something that we don't? It's interesting, in his letter to the church at Philippi, another town where he started a church, uh, he said this. I think we have this on the screen. He said, you know, folks, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. He wasn't just saying it to the Corinthians. He was saying to the Philippians too, I have learned the secret of contentment and I wonder what is that secret? And I wonder, do we really want to know? If we could find out the secret, would we want to know? At the end of our section today, after Paul tells the folks what they had been through and how they reacted to it, He goes on to tell the Corinthians, you know, we have been open and honest with you and we have loved you fully, but you have not reciprocated. You have not shown us the same love that we have shown you. He said, for God's sake, people, open your hearts wide. Open your hearts. And there it is. Did you hear the secret to contentment? An open heart. The secret is an open heart. What does that mean? I think an open heart means a deliberate tearing down of the walls that we build to protect ourselves. You can probably close your eyes right now and think of a million things that you would not want to encounter. You, you just, the, just the thought of it makes you cringe, and so you avoid any situation that gets you close to that thing, right? Right? Paul says, tear down those walls. Open your heart. It means to choose vulnerability. It means risking hurt and rejection. It means choosing love over fear. Paul says this is the secret to being content in every situation that you encounter, an open heart. Sounds a lot like Jesus, right? 
Jesus would say these crazy things like, if you want to save your life, you must lose it. If you want to follow me, you must take up your own cross and come and endure the things. How can entering into the thing that we, we do not want lead us into greater life? How is that possible? I love, I love, I love how the message translation captures this end part of Paul's statement to the Corinthians. Look at this. Dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. Do you hear what Paul is is telling them? You have to embrace the thing that you fear the most. The, the, The thing that you're scared of. The thing that you find distasteful. You've got to face that head on with an open heart. Because there is a spaciousness to life that can be accessed when you have an open heart. And Paul says, at least in the message translation, any smallness, any dissatisfaction that you have with life only comes from within yourself. You know what I'm going to say here. You know what I'm going to say. And it's contrary probably to what you've been told. The fullness of life depends on you. Now, we don't hear that a lot. We hear that the fullness of life, uh, we depend on God. But Paul seems to be seeing, and Jesus says a similar thing. If you want to seek the kingdom, the kingdom is already within you, right? Jesus said that to the Pharisees. Paul seems to be saying the same thing. There's a spaciousness to life. It is already yours. It's already been given to you. The gift has been given to you but it requires a new outlook. It requires a new perspective. It requires that you enter what Jesus calls the kingdom of heaven. It is this place of joy, of peace. Not because circumstances have changed, but because you have a new way to see it, a new way to look at it. And so I ask you right now as you sit here, do you see life as a glass half empty or a glass half full? Do you see lack or potential? Do you sit here and think, I have nothing, or as Paul said, actually we have everything. Knowing what I know, we have everything. God has given us the kingdom. All the riches of God are ours as children. We are inheritors of this, and yet we live like we are paupers. I've got a friend named Erica. She's here today. I first met Erica when, in the spring, we had drive-through prayer. Remember when we did that? We, we opened it up and people could drive through and get a prayer and a blessing. She came through that day, and we met her and prayed with her, and One thing that she asked is, is why is it so hard in Palestine to find a church that isn't locked up during the week? Why do we have to wait till Sunday to go in and kind of pray at the altar? And we said, well, we're here. You know, most of the time we're we're in and out, but we're here and we're happy to have anybody come by. And she called Brandy this week and said, hey, any chance I can come by and pray? And so she did. She came and afterwards she was telling us how She just felt uh, a burden had been lifted from her. And I thought, you know, this is this openness that Paul is talking about. Being open. uh, Coming into a place that you don't really know anybody. You don't know anything about them. But you feel God saying, this is is what I want you to do. This is actually going to lead to life. And so she followed that with an open heart. And so I asked her, I said, would you like to give a testimony today about what you've experienced in the last few weeks with this new 
expansive spaciousness that comes with an open heart. And she was nice enough to say yes. I'd like to invite Erica to come up and just say what's on your heart today. Hi, um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm from here, born and raised, and um, moved to Houston back in 2010 for about 13 years. Life was hectic, hard. Talk about trying to find a church home. Huh. You got to make appointments to talk to your pastor. You got to make appointments to come into church. It's not like it was here when I was raised here. You can come and go to church and fellowship with people and you're hands-on and you can get prayed for and talk to and fellowship with your people. Go out to lunch. Go visit, go visit the sick and shut in. It's not like that up there. It's too fast. So me and my family decided that it would be best to come back home. Start back in my old church that I went to. Well, guess what? With that old church, I went there. Jesus didn't meet me there. Yeah, so I toyed with that a lot about leaving, knowing that it would upset a lot of people, even some of my family. But I had to follow my heart. I knew that what I was looking for, the depths I wanted to go in Jesus, that vehicle no longer served me anymore. What I came to say, folks, is that we serve a living God. We serve a God that is able to do anything. I remember when I came back, I came back angry. I was upset at the world and me because life didn't go as I ex expected and planned as a little girl. Life happened. Situations happened that some of them were irrevitable. Um, I came back and um, I remember I was at the doctor's office and um, I was trying to find another church home. I was in the midst of going through with my family but still knowing in my heart that I had to go. You have to seek Jesus and his peace in any way you can get it. So um, I was online. Brandy popped up. <laughs> Went to school with Brandy. We were actually friends until I moved away. So um, <laughs> she popped up, come through drive through. I looked twice. I was at the chiropractor's office right down the street from here. And I said, this can't be real, Lord. If it's real, this is you. They, they'll tell you, I passed it two or three times just to see was it for real. But I came on in, and they were real. They prayed for me. When I tell you, I was doing things that would jeopardize my career. God has been good to me. I've been a nurse almost 25 years, intensive special ICU nurse that worked for um, special needs kids. But the things that I was doing did not line up to the person that I wanted to be, the person God called me to be. But I had, I was looking for God. I was cold. My heart was not in the right place anymore. I was angry because I couldn't find him at my church. I'm angry because I was trying to find people that understood or didn't single me out because I wanted more from the God that we serve. Because I knew he had more for me. We don't have to live small lives in Christ. He gives us so much more. Like he said, the kingdom is at our hands. So, um... God delivered me. When I came here to prayer, I was sorrowful. When I say chains were broken at that time, God delivered me from smoking. And I smoked for like maybe 10 years. God delivered me. I hadn't picked up anything since, since then. God delivered me from another addiction. I'm 30 years. I won't go into it, but I'll say that God did it. If he can do it for me, when my heart was cold, I didn't want to pray, didn't know how to pray, but it took coming here, that one simple prayer opened it to me. It turned my heart back toward God, and I started wanting more. So every time I come, they're available for me to, to come to the church and able to just pray. And I thank God for that. I thank God for deliverance. I thank God for him giving me another chance, renewing my strength. Because now I can say, I'm happy. I can say I don't have to hide any addictions from anybody anymore. I can live my life transparent and I, wanna, and I want everything in this life that God has to offer me. Heaven on earth. 
So I came here to testimony to say my testimony because the word of God says we're overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Mm-hmm. So I want to say to anyone that is struggling with any type of addiction, anything, just being stagnant in life, not knowing or coming and feeling like, God, there's got to be more like I was feeling. I can't make it like this. I'm not going to make it. I am not my life. I don't know where I would be, just to be very honest with you, if I'd stayed in Houston three more months. If I not found this church home that I found now, I wouldn't be here. I would not be standing here sane and stable as I am now and sound and saying that I'm ready to do God's work for him in any way possible. I'm ready to serve him in any way, in any capacity. And I want to say thank you for having me. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do something a little bit different. Normally, at this point, we would have communion and then play a song. I'm going to invite (laughs) folks, and and I'm going to ask if you would stay up here to pray with anybody that comes up. Jason, I'm going to ask you to come up. David, will you come up? You don't have to. Come on, Susie. Come on, Susie. I'm standing up here. I looked. I thought, I know. And mind you, this has been however many, 30 years years ago. And I thought, I know her. And when I looked and she, I said, have 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 you been here before? She said, no. And I said, I know you. I know you. And I do know her. That's awesome. She's a sweet person. That's wonderful. And, 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 and I'm not, not to toot your horn, but she just got off a 12-hour shift. She just worked a 12-hour shift, pediatric nurse, came and slept in the parking lot for a few hours so that she could come up and give this testament. That's how serious she is about what God has done for her uh, just over the last few weeks. And so I, I just want to leave some space here. I'm going to play some music. If you feel like you want to come up and just pray silently up here, you can. If you want one of these folks to pray for you, they are happy to do it. If you want to remain at your seat and pray, you can. If you want to turn around and kneel at your chair, you can. There's no rules here, but I I want to leave some space for folks that say, God, I want an open heart. And, And I don't even know what that means exactly. But if Paul says we need to have an open heart and that through it we can experience all the riches that God has for us, I want that. I want to leave space for you to express that to God, okay? And so however you feel as I play this song, just whatever God is leading you to do, do that, okay? And if you want to sing, too, you can sing. Listen while you still can hear. Listen while you still can hear the Master's calling, the Master's calling. Bow down while your knees still Bow down while your knees still bend. The Master's calling. The Master's calling. I don't want to walk away. Walk away from Him. I don't want to walk away. Don't want to walk away from Him. Bind me to Your side. 
Bind me to your side. Seek him though your eyes don't see. Seek him though your eyes don't see. The Master's calling, the Master's calling, praise Him while your lips still sing, praise Him while your lips still sing. The Master's calling, the Master's calling. I don't want to walk away, walk away from here. Listen while you still can hear. Listen while you still can hear. The Master's calling. The Master's calling. Bow down while your knees still bend. Bow down while your knees still bend. The Master's calling. The Master's calling. Stand. Go ahead and stand up. Sing this with me. Seek him though your eyes don't see. Seek him though your eyes don't see. The master's call. Praise Him while your lips still sing. Praise Him while your lips still sing. The Master's calling. The Master's calling. I don't. 
Bind me to your side. Grab the hand of the person next to you. As you go from this place, receive this blessing. May the love of God, the light of Christ, and the life of the Spirit be in you. May your relationship with God be such that you cannot tell where God ends and you begin. May you be one with creation one with your neighbor and one with each other. And should you forget this week who you are and whose you are, rest assured God never forgets, and that's really all that matters. But open your heart this week, and you'll remember. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, please take that good word, believe it, and go from this place in peace to love and serve your Lord.